Being Black in America comes with its challenges. However, we understand that enlightenment through education is the oppressor's worst fear. By bridging the gap between academia and the people, our purpose is to equip you with knowledge that breaks down barriers during your journey towards truth and freedom. Welcome to the Black and Highly Dangerous Podcast. Hey, Dev, what's up? What's up? How your week been? What's been going on? You know, my week has gone pretty well. I cannot complain too much. I feel like I have officially, over the course of the last, what, five weeks in 2022, reclaimed my weekends for me. Um, and I know because every time Saturday and Sunday comes around, I'm like, wow, that was really quick. So like now that weekends mean a lot to me now, it's like they, they come and go so quickly. <laughs> you're not worried about work and stuff yeah mm-hmm. that's what usually happens time flies when you're having fun doing things at least that, that are fun to you like relaxing I'm sure mm-hmm. <laughs> that's good that's good yeah I got one more week of um, I guess chaos because the search that I've been doing for the campus finishes up mm-hmm. and then I can get back to like my regular rhythm and routine of like just you know just teaching and other things that I do on the side but uh, way more predictable and way more of my own time that is dedicated to this campus where I search. <laughs> yeah. um, takes a lot of space. This is my first search doing like a a leadership role, administrative role mm-hmm. on the campus. And mm-hmm. so it's different than like faculty and all this other kind of stuff, just because you got to get all the major big parties involved on the campus, all the admin presidents and provosts and all these other people that are supremely busy <laughs> trying to get them all on one accord to get these candidates and see these candidates and stuff like that. So it's a whole different ball game. Mm, mm, yeah. I mean, that's really cool though. I guess that what happens when you get tenure, you get these like leadership roles and stuff. Yeah. Opportunity, I guess to help choose leadership. Right yeah, now. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I mean that it, it takes a leader to select another leader. So yeah, I can yeah. look at it that way too. <laughs> so it was cool. Um, you know, just getting experience when I usually, what well, my my um since I've you know past couple years my motto has just been like if it's something new I'll say yes if it's something I've done before I usually say say no when I get asked to do things um so this was definitely a new type of search I was like oh let me get this one a shot mm-hmm. put that on the CV line you know you know how we academics do <laughs> yeah yeah add add um, another line mm-hmm mm-hmm well other than that everything's been pretty cool been battling this head cold thanks to uh, you know my daughter in daycare. So oh a little goodness. stuffy, me and me and the wife, the whole family been stuffy this past week and some change. Yeah. <laughs> like what kind of germs y'all got in these daycares, man? <laughs> and that's the thing about daycare. It's like, well, one, before COVID, it was always a thought, well, you know, they're going to get everything they need in terms of, you know, the germs. They're going to have mm-hmm. the best immune system in the world. But it's just like, oh, my goodness. In, in COVID times, don't nobody want to even be slightly sick. I know. <laughs> my mom, when she hear me, she's like, oh, is it? Check your temperature. You know, people are like, it's not COVID. It's just a stuffy nose. <laughs> uh, but it's funny now. Everybody thinks that, you know, you cough, you sneeze, whatever. People are thinking it's COVID symptoms. Um, but I don't blame them. You know, this past two years have been a bit traumatizing. When we talk about is it COVID? Is it the flu? Is it a cold? Who knows? Yeah. Uh, that's how we've been on edge. Um, but okay. Uh, we got some, oh Lord, news stories to share. Um, before we get to today's special guest, we do have an interview lined up for you all today, but we'll talk about that after we cover some of, um, you know, the hot topics of this past week. Hello, and welcome to BHD News, where we give you the most current and eye opening, oh Lord, news of the week. Join us as we present news that'll make you want to say, Okay, so you know how you talked about Joe Rogan's um, controversy last week. Um, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you hear about how The Rock inserted himself into the controversy? Yep, and then quickly ejected himself from the (laughs) But it was too late because Mm -hmm. everyone has been digging up 
all of the rocks like past problematic tweets and it seems like he's going on a like deleting spree as well um he called john Zena like a what's you know a gender slur um he um uh, there was like somebody i think joe rogan might have said like the n-word in the past or something and oh they might found, have Oh he, has he? I don't know. Because it's yeah. like they just show an example. And then, you know, The Rock supposedly called him out and somebody found like a video of like The Rock or either a tweet that's like, like making fun of like an Asian accent. And it's just like, you should have just sat there and ate your food, Rock. Should have just been quiet. Ain't nobody asked you to jump to this man's defense. Um, it all kind of started though because um, Ndiaye wanted to her music pulled from Spotify because of Joe Rogan, so she didn't want it on the platform anymore with a bunch of other music artists. Actually, uh, I think um, I want to say in that pat like that ten day span, Spotify lost like some like ten billion dollars, something like that, mm. because of Joe Rogan. So that's why he had to come out and apologize because he was costing them big money. Um, but they're still like standing by him, although their CEO just had like a big meeting with everyone and saying like, listen. I don't agree with this. I know a lot of you are upset. We don't agree with this, but you know, we're kind of about free speech. And then sometimes when that happens, yeah, we're going to have to deal with people who we don't agree with. Um, but yeah, so, but that, uh, in the IRE, she was posting like this. It was like a compilation video um, of him saying the N word mm-hmm. like, mad times over the years. It wasn't just like a one time thing. It's like, <laughs> It was just like a whole one minute, two minute clip of him. All these like, like two second clips of him just saying the N word on his podcast. So, yeah. Oh, okay. When, yeah, when, yeah, that, yeah. when that came out, The Rock. That's when The Rock like, withdrew. Mm-hmm. OK. OK. Mm-hmm. That makes a little bit more sense because I just saw like a tweet that referenced like, oh, The Rock says, you know, Joe Rogan is racist for saying the N word. But then he has like this tweet or video mocking Asian people, you know, saying certain things and I'm not going to repeat it myself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's just like, what, what even possessed the rock to come out anyway, to do that? Like just let people <laughs> burn their own house down. Yeah. It's just, um, that they, I think they are, you know, they're probably, they're probably friends and they definitely are in similar spaces. Um, for sure. Like Joe Rogan is like the UFC guy. And The Rock is a big UFC guy, so I'm sure they hang out, they talk, um, and all that kind of stuff. So they probably have this history. So he came out to try to defend his buddy without really... And I'm like, yo, you have to know how your friend is, though. Ain't no way he's been doing this for years, and you are just now getting abreast of this. Um, yeah. So it's probably just because it actually came out that he had to publicly backtrack. Otherwise, yeah. he might have kept one. And they actually pulled like 100 of his episodes or something like that off of Spotify as well. All the ones that had all that... um controversial statements and him saying their word or whatever they pull all those episodes too well it's good uh but i, I it's just kind of sad that spotify is still sticking by him mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. you know i don't subscribe to spotify anyway so not yeah, saying that <laughs> apple it, you know everybody got issues but i just think with all that like racism that he spews on his podcast. I cannot believe they're just still sick about him. But And okay. COVID misinformation. Yep. Like he good. He has a number one podcast in the world. Like that's the issue. It's like out of, out of everyone. Like he has the biggest numbers. They don't want Mainly to lose he's that been money. Uh huh. Yeah. Yep. It's just, that's a big get. And they get paid him a whole lot of money to get him there. But I knew once he apologized, I said, oh no. Because you know, somebody with that much money and power typically like the, you know, they like to double down, but um, when he costing them billions of dollars, <laughs> he's like, ah, nah, bro, you better fix this. It's like a cost benefits for. analysis. Like, how mm-hmm. much are you bringing in versus how much are you costing us? Yeah, and we definitely ain't paying you no billions, so you have fixed it. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so, yeah, and, and I don't know if you saw it too, I think last week's episode, we had somebody, one of our listeners, I think, comment on Facebook, kind of getting on us for even mentioning Joe Rogan. <laughs> Wait, say that again? I said one of our listeners was kind of getting, I think it was a comment on Facebook getting on us for uh, even mentioning Joe Rogan. That is so... It was, they were I, mean, like, oh, I can't believe y'all even mentioned him. Are, you, are y'all surprised? Like, you know? I'm like, well, no, yeah, I guess the question We're not is surprised, surprised but, no. but it was a big headline. You know, so it was worth mentioning, but it was funny. I feel you, though. I feel you. Sometimes we shouldn't even give space to these fools like this, but, you know, sometimes we got to. 
and for my people. But it was just funny. Mm-hmm. Shout out to that listener. <laughs> Yeah, shout out to the listener, you know, <laughs> hold our feet to the fire, and be, you know, giving the wrong people attention. Like, no, for real. It's yeah, like, no, I, I don't listen to y'all to hear about that. You know? Hear about Joe Rogan and, <laughs> and his racism. I get it. I get it. It's funny, though. Um, OK, you got another story? Yeah. So, you know, we're talking about the potential for Biden to appoint a black woman to the United States Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they've been putting out fillers and there have been polls to see how much Americans actually support that idea. Among all respondents, 53 percent of just on average, you know, respondents, everybody strongly support and 33 percent somewhat support uh, Biden's plan to nominate a black woman to the Supreme Court. Oh, wow. So that's almost like 80 percent support. Oh, ac- you know what? You know what? Actually, it, those are the numbers added together. So okay, okay, it's 33 okay, percent okay. strongly support, 20 percent somewhat support. Makes sense. Because I was like, hey, not 80 percent. Yeah, like, I was just like, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> OK, the way they had that word there is like, OK. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, sometimes it's tricky. Yeah. Um, but among Republicans. Um, only about half support, you know, overall, um, 27% said they would either strongly support or somewhat support. So only 27% of Republicans said that. So about half of what everybody feels overall. Um, and the remainder either strongly opposed 31% or somewhat opposed 17%. And there were wow. like 25% that were unsure. So it's almost split half and half, which is a little bit more people on the side of supportive. Um, it's kind of weird. I don't know what the big issue is. Yeah. Country, man. It's just interesting. Yeah. Why people are so mad about it. But I think it's because they also know <laughs> polit- politically, you know, black women are going to hold it down uh, historically. It's going to get on there and be a no-nonsense na- court. <laughs> yeah, they know that. that you know. They know that they ain't going to get this vote on many of the things they be trying to get through. Mm-hmm. Um, so I can see why a lot of folks, especially a lot of white folks in particular, wouldn't be whether no matter what side we know that, you know, white privilege is upheld on both sides of the political spectrum. So, mm-hmm. you know, there's some things that they probably thinking about that's like, ah, it's not going to be in our favor. Yeah. So let's not do this. <laughs> Speaking and, of not things, uh, things not being in like Republicans favor. It has recently been reported that Republicans are now frantic that Trump supporters will sit out of the midterms because they think that elections are rigged. I, I, you know what? You know, I, I ain't going to be mad at that one if that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so interesting because a lot of the candidates are being put in this. Well, it shouldn't be an awkward position, but they view it as an awkward position because, you know, they're being asked, like, do you think the 2020 election results were rigged? And there's a right answer. If you're a Trump supporter, Mm -hmm. there's the truthful answer that (laughs) if you answer that way, it's actually going to turn those voters off from you. But if you also say it was rigged, you know, they're saying like, well, what's the point of voting now? Because it's rigged. So it's like, a, wh- what do you say? <laughs> yeah, Trump got them uh, in, in between a rock and a hard place, as they say. <laughs> so these were probably gay. They laid, that, they laid their bed, now they got to lay in it. Mm-hmm. And they made their bed, they got to lay in it. So um, I don't feel bad for them. You know, figure out a way to navigate this one. But hopefully it does cost y'all some votes because at the end of the day, these Democrats are going to need that kind of help <laughs> if they're going to try to win anything. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure. I'm yeah. sure. Well, those were kind of my stories. I did find like a random story from 2020 that might help explain uh, some folks confusion in the political world because it was like uh, a national National Center for Education Statistics report that came out in like 2019 or 2020 that said only um, I think it said like 54 percent of adults in the United States cannot read past like a sixth grade level mm. or read, they read below. Yeah. A sixth mm. grade, in terms of like pros. Okay. So it's just kind of like, Hmm, is, is that why? 
Is that it? <laughs> I mean, it wouldn't surprise me. It would not surprise me. I mean, again, and then that was one of the things I think there was like articles talking about that, especially someone like Trump was able to reach certain populations because he just spoke in a manner that they understood. And you know, he accessible. definitely. Yeah. And we always people would joke like, oh, he speaks like he's speaking to, you know, third graders or something like that. Well, hey, so a certain population, that's what they prefer. Uh, to understand what is actually being said. Let's be straight and direct and to the point by the extra fluff and hula that, you know, other politicians can speak, you know, speak around you in circles. And so yeah. um, I can see that. But I think folks need to pay attention to that strategy a little bit and, yeah, learn how to speak uh, more simply about policy and ideas instead of over people's heads. You know, that's real. I was actually about to ask you, do you think that – not like talking down to people, but like, do you think it would be a good idea for more progressive people to stop being so professorial? Or at least I, I'm not saying that, that they are, but it seems like that is a perception of a lot of more progressive candidates. I remember like that was a hit against uh, Barack Obama when he was in office and on campaign trail, like, oh, he came off so professorial. And I, I don't know, you have to connect with voters, the, you know, where they are and in a message and tone that speaks to them. So it might be something to think about. Yeah, there's definitely something to think about. When we talk about top, you know, we talk about the 1% of America, even if you talk about that top 10%, I mean, if you think about the other 90%, I mean, even a, first off, folks are not in academia. Folks are not professors. Folks don't sit in conferences and, and these kind of sit, and these kind of educated spaces. I think when we get in these bubbles, folks think that majority of Americans are used to that. It's not the case. So I think I'm all for, especially us as educators. You know, we kind of know that's like our goal is always to try to break things down to the most easiest way possible, so that our students can just understand it um, and then build from there. And if you can't even have the skill set to do that, then yeah, it's going to be trouble. Um, and that's, that's the thing, like even people talk about Democrat stuff now, about the stats and the data and the facts. Honestly, a lot of people don't care for that as much, you know, um, as we would for sure. And that means a lot to it. But if they can't just understand, like, what does this mean to me in my everyday life? Just break it down. Give me the quick spark notes version. That's what folks want. I think it's just really knowing your audience. And if you're trying to reach the, as many people as possible, then you should make as many people as possible understand what you're trying to say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yeah, it's not, and like you said, it's not about talking down on people or anything like that. It's just making a very clear, simple message, getting your point across. Um, I remember they used to tell us that. Wasn't that like a practice, I would say, in grad school? They'd be like, you should be able to, you, you know, you can explain your dissertation or your research well. You can like explain it's like a kindergartner or a fifth grade or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, it was always like a practice. They say you should learn how to do. Yes, yes. How can you explain your research or what you're trying to get across in a way that can connect to people who don't know the jargon? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yep. I think that's something that these politicians should start living by. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it'll pay pay off positively, hopefully. Uh, but yeah, you're right. Yeah. But that was an interesting study to see that that data, mm -hmm. uh, how many Americans, you know, that's that's not that high of a level. So that's something to keep in the back of your mind, folks. Yeah. Um, OK, I got a couple stories. Uh, one is um, we've talked about the metaverse and, you know, there's this big issue that happened. I don't know if we talked about it last. I don't think we talked about it last week. Uh, with the metaverse, but um, a woman who went to the metaverse uh, had a traumatic experience. Um, she's 43-year-old Nina Patel, and she went into the metaverse, and within 60 seconds of joining the metaverse, she was verbally and sexually harassed and also gang raped in the metaverse. Oh, uh, my goodness. Yes, yes. It was a wild story. Um, it was three to four male avatars with male voices who she said uh, virtually gang raped her avatar, were taking photos. She was trying to get away. She was yelling. They were yelling at her and yelling obscenities at her, trying to grab her and saying all this really wild stuff I'm not even going to get into um, in the metaverse. And so, you know, this had a lot of folks thinking like, oh, wow, okay, you know, we was, you know, we all had conversations about the metaverse and what it can mean and what the possibilities are and what it would be like. But a lot of folks actually weren't thinking about, um, 
you know, there's a lot of wild people, especially we know um, in the digital age on social media period, that be in people's comments and DMs doing a lot of things. And now you're going to give these people a platform in the metaverse to do and say these things when you can actually like hear their voices and they're like grabbing you and touching you. Um, so it was a really traumatic experience where her, literally within 60 seconds of getting in there, this is what happened. Um, because it's new, there's no regulations and no rules yet because all this is being pilot tested and people are trying to learn how it operates. But that definitely put a big red flag onto it. And these companies actually responded really quickly and a few days ago said that they created a new um, like setting where you can go in and put like, it's almost like a do not disturb mode. And so people, it's called personal boundary mode. And then people can't talk to you and they can't be within four feet of your avatar. It like blocked them if they try to get close and they, you can't hear them and all this other kind of stuff. So they have responded, but this is something definitely to be concerned about as this metaverse grows and what can be like the possibilities of it. You know, that is disturbing. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. like, oh my goodness, what was it seemed like supposed to be a positive virtual you just get the same things you have in the real world because yeah. it's the same people mm-hmm. and probably probably even worse like it's just weird because it's like you can't can you really escape people in the metaverse like they can they just follow you it's like a weird out of me i haven't been there yet um but yeah it's a scary situation um and how immersive it can be i had a friend over the weekend playing this some game it's called something about lies or something like that and it's kind of it's not a metaverse game yet but it, it will be. And just watching him play, I'm like, oh no. Like if this was like, if I had that virtual thing on my eyes and was playing this game, I was like, it's like too immersive. Like the things you're doing and the reflections you see. And I'm like, yo, this really, these games, this world can really have like a serious psychological impact on people. If you're playing like depressive games or games about, you know, whatever. If you're experiencing these things, like she experienced this virtually, but had real life effects um, in the real world. So I think like this is something to be concerned about, especially, you know, when we're talking about kids being involved in this kind of stuff. They already we already see things with them on social media. Now them being in this immersive world, like it can be really scary if going unchecked. And for sure, you know, I think folks should definitely proceed with caution as this thing continues to develop. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Agree. Mm hmm. Um, another story that I saw was that, um, and this is for people to know, especially for folks out there in Atlanta, is that um, there are scammers doing a new scam, um, and they actually have been putting fake eight, uh, Atlanta parking citations and parking tickets on people's cars. Um, <laughs> and so what they've been doing is putting parking tickets with... Uh, a QR code. So the actual real parking tickets don't have a QR code. And so what they're saying, they, and they look exactly like the real ones, but just with a QR code and they can put a little ex, um, explanation on the back, how they do on tickets and saying, Hey, you can use this QR code to pay your ticket immediately without any issue. And so folks are getting these tickets, let scanning the QR code and just giving the money right into the scammers account. So if you see a, a parking ticket with the QR code, uh, please, Do not give them your money because it is not a real ticket. You know, Atlanta scammers are just so interesting (laughs) to me. Like, I remember when I lived there right after college and it was always something with some parking and some cars because you go to the club, it'd be people in vests, like pretending to be like parking attendants, just taking your money. And it's just, they're so (laughs) interesting. (laughs) Uh, they be out there hustling for their coin. Hustling mm-hmm. for their coin, for sure. Um, but I just want to make our listeners aware of that. Um, another story, um, and this is a big one. Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe you've heard of. You probably heard it about it, Def. But um, the NFL lawsuit going on. Um, so Brian Lo- Brian Flores, who was actually the coach, head coach of my favorite team, the Dolphins, um, black head coach. Um, was one fired quick backstory um, at the end of the season, which sent up a lot of red flags, like pretty much all expert analysis and sports analysis were very like wondering why he was fired me as well, because he was a good coach. It was only his third season. And he was the first coach ever because they started the season like 0-7. And, and then they, we went on like a 7-8 and eight game winning streak and almost made the playoffs. Mm-hmm. So he turned the team around. So again, he wasn't a bad coach by any means. And he had a young team. Uh, but then the Dolphins fired him. And so folks were like, uh, why? Because he's a good coach and he did wonderful things. Usually only the terrible coaches get fired. Um, 
And then as a result, when you get fired, you go interview at other places who are looking for head coaches, which he did. And then he really didn't get anything. And then um, last week came out last Monday. He um, announced that he is suing um, three NFL teams and the NFL for racism and discrimination. Mm -hmm. Um, Apparently what happened is, I mean, he has a whole bunch of evidence against some of these teams. Um, One is that the Dolphins owner, while he was coach, wanted him to uh, lose on purpose and then offered him $100,000 per game that he would lose so that they can get a better draft pick. Uh, When he was on the job market right after he got fired, he was going to interview with the New York Giants, right? Mm -hmm. And three days before he went to his interview, he got a text from Bill Belichick, who is the coach of the New England Patriots. Mm -hmm. And Bill Belichick said, hey, congratulations, uh, Brian, la, 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 for getting the job, et cetera. And um, he was like, what? What are you talking about? And then Bill, I guess, went back to look at wherever he got his message. He's like, oh, I'm sorry. I meant um, this was actually Brian Diablo. Um, That's who I meant it was for. And Brian Flores was like, "Uh, "Okay, that's weird, but, you know, no problem. He went to his Giants interview three days later. A couple days after that, the Giants wind up hiring Brian Dablo, um, oh, white my guy. <laughs> and so, so they knew who they were hiring before they even brought Brian Flores in. Clearly, because they, you know, they spread the word and had told Bill Belichick, and he messed up and just texted the wrong, the wrong Brian. Brian. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the most damning pieces of evidence they have, and he has other things as well. Uh, to, you know, corroborate his story. Of course, all these teams are coming out saying, oh, this is completely false and fabricated and not true. But we know, come on. Text, that, that is like clear evidence. <laughs> like that is clear. I mean, that is by no coincidence. Like you clearly told Belichick that, yo, this Brian got the job three days before you even interviewed the black guy. So, you know, his argument is that a lot of these teams just interviewed him because they have... Um, uh, I forgot the this clause. Uh, I, can't, I can't remember the name of it now. Where now all teams kind of have to interview mm-hmm. black candidates mm-hmm. um and so his case saying hey they do it for show but they really don't want us because right now there's only there's no black owners in the league there's only one black coach in the league that's mike tomlin with the steelers and 70 percent of the league is black um and so you know i think he has a big case you know nfl and them are shaking in their boots roger goodell came out the other day and said hey uh you know, we have some issues and, you know, we're going to work things out and try to improve. He didn't even really denounce it, which was interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think he got some really hardcore. Another black coach actually came out who was a coach of the Cleveland Browns a few years ago and says, hey, I'm joining this lawsuit with you. I got evidence as well. He said he was also uh, offered to get paid to lose games and stuff like that. Um, and what's interesting is because, you know, again, that's the rationale they used to fire you is when you lose games. But mm-hmm. if these owners are paying you to lose games, it's like, uh, yeah, that's messed up in so many different ways. I mean, that 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 means the whole system is... Um... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm like, wow. Uh, yeah, if two coaches come out, two different teams saying that their owners were paying them to lose games, clearly that's something they do frequently mm-hmm. and often. But it's like weird. Like all this stuff that goes hush-hush behind closed doors is now coming out. He said, you know, I know I'll probably never work in the NFL again, but he was like, some, some fights you know, are, are worth the fight. And he was like, it's time the NFL be held accountable for mm-hmm. the racism. And hopefully all of this will make a change. So it's a big, big story going on in the NFL. We'll see how it, you know, progresses over time. Cause you know, these kind of lawsuits are probably going to take a couple years, I am sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it will be something to keep an eye on because we already had our suspicions that they do a lot of racist things over there. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So my final, I guess, story, but I think it's worth mentioning, kind of want to hear your thoughts about this, Dav. Have you heard about the whole Whoopi Goldberg situation? Yes. Um, yeah, I heard about it. Yeah. So ABC suspended Whoopi Goldberg for two weeks over a Holocaust statement. Essentially, in her statement, she was saying that um, the Jewish community and the Jews during Holocaust, they're not a race. Um, I forgot. She was responding to something or someone who was saying, you know, this was kind of a uh, a racist act or, or a race-based uh, genocide, et cetera. And she was saying, you know, they're not race. They're not a race. They still have white privileges, things along those lines. And there was a whole bunch of backlash where she kind of apologized, but didn't really apologize. And then um, ABC wind up suspending her for a couple of weeks over her statements to think about it. I know her co-hosts were also upset about that. They didn't take that kindly. Uh, but there was a lot of conversations going on social media about Judaism or being Jewish or religion. Is it a race? You know, what, 
uh, constitutes being a race and all these questions. And I thought it was just interesting to see, you know, how this played out by those comments. And again, we heard about things in the past. We see things in the past, especially when folks offend the Jewish community. We see a lot of this kind of action, especially in the entertainment industry being taken. And I thought it was an interesting conversation about uh, race. And for me personally, right, I know there's probably a lot of other ways to think about this, but at least here in America, when we discuss race, I don't ever view being Jewish as, as a race, right? Um, most of the, I know there are people who are Jewish are of all races and descents, et cetera. Uh, but predominantly in America, we see them uh, predominantly being white in many cases and, and still benefiting from the privilege of whiteness. And, um, you know, I had questions like on the census, what if they are a race? What is in that category? What did they click <laughs> when, they, when they ask about your racial category on the census and things like that? So I see what, where, uh, what Whoopi was getting at and the controversy around it. Um, I know that was just a big talking point this week that I just wanted to mention Yeah, really quickly. I feel like maybe one issue, and I didn't follow it closely, is that I think her take is a bit ahistorical in terms of like when that was happening. Like, we, we know that notions of race evolve over time. Like there's actually this book that, that I, I love uh, It's called uh, How Jews Became White Folks and What That Says About Race in America. And it's mm-hmm. by Peggy Brocken. And I, I'm pretty sure I read that in a social class at Purdue, but it's just kind of like what we see now is not always how things like have been. And so in terms of like what was happening with the Holocaust, I do not know what was in like the minds of like the Nazis and stuff like that, but I I don't think they thought they were white. Oh yeah. And no, I don't no, know if def- it's controversial for me to say that. Like I I, <laughs> I I don't even know what's allowed to be said or not. I, I ain't yeah. trying to be canceled and stuff like that. Yeah. So I, I don't I don't even like to comment on this stuff, but I can say that I think some of that was a historical. Yeah, no, I, I get no, I definitely agree with you there. And I and that's the issue with some of these conversations that it scares people from actually just having a conversation about it. Um and I do think that, yeah, for sure when you're talking about that time period and what was happening at the Holocaust, they were, you know, the propaganda, the stereotypes, the images, they were, they were definitely treated like a race. And I can see that argument being made. And then, uh, but I think my argument wasn't for that. It was just that I seen a lot of folks trying to compare that to the now. Um, And so, yes, if Whitney, I mean, not Whitney, if Whoopi was talking about, you know, them in that time period and, and how they were viewed as a, not viewed as a race. And that's probably in, inaccurate. Uh, but folks who were taking that and saying, like, trying to say that they are viewed as a race today in America, that's where I would have uh, some pushback on and saying, no, nah, that's I can't let that one fly. Um, yeah, I think it's about context and the time period you're talking about for sure. And wasn't you and, talking and where about talking what about. happened then, though? I think so. I think so. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, about you talking about the Holocaust? Yeah. yeah the comments were about the Holocaust. Yeah. yeah. And I uh-huh. think that is the issue. The issue. Yeah. yeah. No, I can see that. I can see that. I won't argue because that is definitely, you know, German history. It's not my forte. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so I definitely will not argue that. And if that was the biggest issue, then I can see, you know, um, that comment. And I think maybe she was, it was almost like, uh, conflating like two timelines like she probably was using her now perspective and thinking about uh, white folks in America now and not thinking about you know what it was like in Germany back then and so I could see the confusion and why folks were probably you know disconnected between the two because I've seen a lot of folks who saying I don't see the issue with it and I was like I'm not arguing with how folks feel during that time period but I know how folks feel today and I think folks should should definitely have distinction between the two Well, one thing I can say is that I wish folks would get suspended over making ignorant comments about black people. Man, like like especially historical incorrect. (laughs) Exactly. Especially inaccurate historical accounts, which we hear a lot of when they talk about us saying that, you know, either slavery was was voluntary and things like that. They try to put in our history books and folks run with. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Nah, Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree with you there. Um, so yeah, it was just interesting. I thought it was just worth mentioning that, you know, uh, you know, I think, I think when you're on these major platforms too, you're speaking on these things, especially like if I was on this major platform and I, for some reason wanted to talk about the Holocaust, knowing what the response would be, 
you just gotta you just gotta do your homework before you before you say certain things, yeah. speak about certain things. Cause you know if you say it incorrectly that the hammer is coming down. Yeah. So at least you want to be very well informed. We see what happened time and time again. Nick Cannon not too long ago was saying some wild stuff. Um, you know, you just gotta be very accurate in your assessments. That's all. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, but what I would say too is that sometimes I would want to see Instead of like them suspending her because she's on a talk show and they bring all kinds of guests in all the time, bring in a scholar or a historian or somebody who is very knowledgeable about that. And then we see that episode of Whoopi talking to this person and we hear both sides. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I think we'd be able to actually see the nuance in it, maybe the depth of the conversation and hear, yes, no, this is why, you know, um, Jewish community was signaled or viewed as a race in Germany during this time period. This is what we went through, et cetera. We can see the parallels instead of just automatically suspending and saying, Oh no, you're wrong. Like let's hear, I, I'm curious. I want to hear more about that side and why folks saying she's wrong, because it's definitely a space that I don't know a lot about. Um, and so that's why I said when it's just weird. Cause when people say these things and they're like the people, we see people get suspended and folks are just scared to have a conversation. I don't think that's fair. Mm -hmm. I think we should be able to talk about it. that's how we all learn, especially on those major platforms. So I think that does a little disservice to the larger community as a whole, because now everyone is still left in the dark about what actually is the truth and why did you suspend her? Right? Like what is the actual truth? And if she's incorrect and tell us what the truth is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but so it is what it is, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but okay, that's all the stories I had. Let's um, uh, introduce today's guest, who is uh, Dr. Aminata Cisse, um, who is a board certified psychiatrist and founder of Amtar Wellness, who's here to talk to us today about, um, you know, psychiatric, psychiatric care and well being for black women um, and women of color particularly uh, black professionals as well. So um, it was a really good conversation, especially, you know, uh, still starting off the new year, but also being in Black History Month is good to just have an expert on to kind of talk about and share advice on what the issues are, what the concerns are, and what are some strategies to help make sure that you are taking care of yourself. So so really, really interesting conversation. I mean, you perfectly described it. Like, <laughs> uh, you know, she gets into the uh, a discussion about the state of like psychiatric medicine, um, because we do also talk about the differences between um, psychiatry and like psychology or counseling psychology. And so we dig into those things. We talk about her organization, Amtar Wellness, as well as a summit that she is planning in Miami this spring. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and we also talk about things like racial trauma and how to deal with that. We ask about advice on how family members can deal with, um, you know, loved ones who are dealing with mental illness and maybe not have all the resources. She offers some good advice on suggestions on how you can navigate that. So, really informative interview. With that we're glad that you know uh, we got to get her on and and drop all these wonderful gems. So. I'm sure you all will enjoy it as much as we did. So without further ado, let's get on Dr. Cisse and then we'll catch up with y'all afterwards. For today's episode, we welcome Dr. Aminata Cisse, a board certified psychiatrist and the founder of Amtar Wellness, which focuses on holistic healing and traditional psychiatric care for specifically black women and women of color. During our conversation, we discussed the state of psychiatric medicine in terms of serving diverse populations, the unique stressors shaping the mental well-being of Black professional women, as well as coping strategies for both those experiencing and supporting others with mental health challenges. Welcome, Dr. Cisse. Hi, good afternoon. How are you? Good, good, good. Glad you could join us. We're really excited um, to connect with you and talk to you more about your work. We've had psychiatrists and psychologists in the past, but yours is a little bit different, and so we're excited to have that fresh perspective come on and talk to our listeners and shed some light. Um, before we get to some of the more specifics of your work, can you just tell us a little bit about your background and your path to pursuing a career in psychiatric medicine? Sure. Um, so I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Um, I grew up in the Prospect Heights neighborhood, which was a wonderful place to grow up. Um, lots of enriching institutions, the Brooklyn Museum, the Central Library. Prospect Park, um, the Brooklyn Academy of Music. And I mention all those places because even though they are the art, they really influence my path to psychiatry and that form of medicine. Um, so 
I, you know, give a shout out to my neighborhood and also my <laughs> immigrant parents who were just very, you know, determined for me to stick to the typical immigrant path of either a lawyer, a doctor, or engineer. So I guess I went towards being a physician. Um, always wanted to do something in science. Always wanted to do something with medicine. And I initially thought I wanted to just be like a bench work um, scientist, but luckily due to my experiences in high school with actually doing um, lab research, I realized that I needed to engage with people in my profession. And I was also very lucky to have um, different black physicians in my network. My pediatrician was from Ghana. Um, my first employer was an African-American dermatologist. Um, I got to shadow lots of different African-American doctors in the Brooklyn and um, Manhattan area. And they showed me that it was possible to become a doctor. Um, I didn't realize I wanted to specifically do psychiatry until I went to medical school. And I saw that I was drawn to um, the specialty just based on how it aligns with my character as a person. I'm a listener. I like to talk to people. I'm very empathic and empathetic. And it was a good mix of the arts. It was a good mix. There's art to psychiatry. We write like the longest notes in medicine. So and I'm a writer. So that really fit. Um, it was a science and it was also just that human connection. So that's how I got to psychiatry. Thank you. You know, I actually have a follow up question because, you know, there's psychiatry and there's, you know, counseling, mm -hmm. you know, some people have like mm -hmm. PhDs and, you know, uh, counseling psychology or clinical psychology. And so can you just talk mm -hmm. to us a little bit about the difference between, you know, psychiatry, MD mm -hmm. and like clinical psychology, mm -hmm. you know, PhD? Both doctors, but one physician, mm -hmm. one doctorate in, a, in another form. And thank you so much for actually having that as a follow-up question, because even sometimes with other medical professionals, I have to <laughs> explain, you know, people that I went to medical school. So I'm like, hey, we went to medical school together. Remember, I'm a psychiatrist. Um, so as you stated, a psychiatrist goes through four years of undergrad, four years of medical school, and then four years of um, study in your specialty and residency. And then there's the option to do additional training in um, different subspecialties such as geriatrics, addiction, um, consult liaison, child and adolescent psychiatry. But essentially I went to medical school the same as your surgeon, the same as your ophthalmologist, the same as your ob -GYN. I just decided that I wanted to study behavioral medicine. Um, and psychiatry is different than those who are psychologists because because I am a medical doctor. I prescribe medications. Some psychiatrists choose after completing their training to just do therapy, but we are educated and trained in the treatment of serious psychiatric illnesses um, that could require medication management as well as therapy, as well as new modalities of treatment um, such as ketamine infusions, uh, TMS, which is transmagnetic brain stimulation, and ECT. And all of those things only a psychiatrist can do. Psychologist, not my, you know, area of expertise, but this is an individual who I believe got a master's, then did a doctoral program, a postdoc, and they primarily provide therapy, um, neuropsychological testing, things like that. That's the difference. That was a clear explanation. No, yeah, yeah. I was about to say thank you for that because I, I do think that people, you know, kind of get them confused a bit. Um, and you Every emphasizing, <laughs> you know, the treatment with medicine and other, uh, you know, therapeutic treatments that are only specific to the practice of psychiatry from an MD. And I, I think that's important to point out um, because both, mm -hmm. you know, fields have really great things to offer, but I don't know if a lot of people actually know the distinction between the two. Yeah, definitely not. Um, and also the portrayal, which is something that I wanted to, something that I always want to talk about, is the portrayal in media is also different, whereas psychologists now are portrayed as like, you know, you sit on a couch, you talk to this person about your feelings, whereas in the media, psychiatrists are kind of, kind of vilified um, and are villains 
because unfortunately we are the only doctors who are able to take away individuals um liberties and rights so psychiatrists can sign two psychiatrists can sign a document to basically put you under psychiatric evaluation for 72 hours and i think our mainstream media has taken advantage of that you know part of our job description and made it into a very very good plot point for a lot of tv shows and that's the difference you know, that's real. That's real. You think about, you know, Law and Order and every single other type of show. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's kind of like, oh, man. Um, but, you know, I guess while we are like on the topic of like the field of psychiatry, can you talk a little bit about like the current state of the field in terms of serving diverse populations? I think in general, there have been you know, conversations about the importance of mental health and wellness within diverse communities. But I like to know a little mm -hmm. bit more about like how the field is like responding to that call. Honestly, I, my response to this question is coming from two years of a pandemic. So prior to the pandemic, I went to the American Psychiatric Association's annual meeting every year. And there I was able to attend like, you know, different lectures, seminars, and just get like a feeling of how academic psychiatry, the, you know, big business of psychiatry, looking at diverse populations. And because I haven't been able to attend those kind of meetings in the context of the pandemic, I can only see what gets issued and put out in statements. So um, the American Psychiatric Association seemed to be very supportive of uh, Black Lives Matter and different issues um, that have arisen over the past two years about mental wellness, better mental health treatment for diverse populations. But in terms of how it's being implemented, I'm going to have to wait until I can go to that annual meeting in May because that's one of the things of doing everything remote you can see lip service, you can see what's stated about an issue, but how that's really being implemented, um, I'm, I wouldn't be able to say until, in, you know, for a couple of months. From my experience, though, I believe that there is a big focus in general, not just in the past year, past two years, but like the past, I would say about five or six years, on training more cultural competent psychiatrists um, because psychiatry is, at the crossroads of medicine and behavioral health and behavioral health is something that is so often difficult to define. Like, how do you feel? We have to use words. There's no test that I can give someone per se or lab value that I can say you are this much less depressed. You know, there's different psychological tests and things like that that have been vetted, but a lot of what we do in psychiatry is very subjective. So it's very important that we are training culturally competent physicians who are able to tease out what mental illness looks like in different populations and training physicians and psychiatrists who are comfortable with talking about not so comfortable things with people who may not look like them. And that is currently, I, I would say that's the current state of psychiatry where we are now is that saying, okay, we use words like microaggressions. We use words like implicit bias. But how are we training people on a day-to-day -day basis so that when they go out into the work world um, after four years of training or one or two years of fellowship training, how capable are, are they of treating diverse populations? And that's a question for, you know, the, those in the ivory towers to answer for psychiatry. No, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, I kind of have a, a, another additional question. Um, when you mentioned the pandemic and then Daphne's question about diverse populations, you know, with, within the, I've been seeing a lot more attention being put to mental health within the black and brown communities, just mainly in popular culture in so many different ways. Um, and I myself on, you know, my family, we've been experiencing with extended family members, folks who have been um, dealing with or developed um, some severe symptoms of mental illness. Um, and then, you know, me being a criminologist, I understand the connection between sometimes mental illness and, and, you know, homelessness and things of that nature, mm -hmm. and even drug and substance abuse. And as I've been dealing with uh, these family members, you know, as a collective, we've all been trying to assist, you know, we realize that it's sometimes really tough to 
help folks, especially when they're adults. Um, and we see, you know, a, a dramatic change in, in personality and behavior. And we recognize that there's mental illness. And sometimes they we, we get them checked in, but then they can check themselves out and things of that nature. Um, you know, what advice would you, and I feel like when I think about these situations, it's not something that's just, you know, unique to my experience, but I think this may be something that a lot of black and brown communities may may deal with because we're just not familiar with the process of how to assist a family member or a loved one when dealing with mental illness. So in these kind of cases, if, you know, family members are struggling to maybe get someone some help or some service, I mean, are there tips or strategies that you can maybe just suggest to to say, hey, this there's a possibility of getting help or sometimes do we just, you know, let it go and, and see what happens? What is your kind of general thoughts or experiences around that? So I think you're already on the right path um, and you're coming from a background of being really learned and you're a scientist, so you approach things in that way. So what I would tell the general public is to do the first thing that you said, educate yourself about the mental illness um, that your family member may be experiencing. Um, Educate yourself about what a psychiatric emergency looks like. When do you just need to call the family member's um, outpatient provider if they have one? Or when is it time to actually go to the hospital and get a higher level of care? Um, A big part of what happens a lot with loved ones who are struggling with mental illnesses, it becomes the disconnect of listening to what they're really saying, listening to what they're experiencing, because you know you care so much about this individual, you want them to get better, you want them to get back to their normal life. And it's coming to terms, the acceptance that their life may never look exactly the same way it did before the diagnosis of the illness. So listening and giving them space to adjust to living with a mental health illness is often a really, really um, big thing that you can do as a family member or a loved one. Um, I always tell individuals whose family members may be resistant to care. Um, as you know, as a criminologist, unfortunately, sometimes you have to involve the law. Um, sometimes in certain states, you will have to go down to the courts and, you know, petition for that individual to um, have a guardian or have them be treated involuntarily. Um, for a couple of weeks or months until they get stable. Um, And that's the issue as well with like serious mental illness. And I'm speaking about schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar disorder. Unfortunately, one of the main components of these illnesses is the lack of insight into having the disorder. So we want to help our family member. We want them to be like, okay, I'm going to take my medication every day. But unfortunately, it doesn't typically go like that. And getting a loved one or a family member or anyone to actually stay committed to a medication regimen is actually one of the hardest parts of it. So unfortunately, sometimes you may have to involve the law. Um, as a family member, you know, who's trying to guide a loved one through their struggles with mental illness, at times as a provider, not as a provider, as a caretaker, you can experience burnout. Um, so I, especially for those who are dealing with a close loved one with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, I would recommend even starting therapy to just discuss. And it doesn't have to be a long-term therapy, but just a short, you know, few months just to discuss the experience of watching this change in your loved one and having some kind of objective support to help guide you through that process of adjusting to your loved one struggling with mental illness. I feel like I went, I'm sorry, I feel like I went all around the circle. No, Did I no, answer that question? Yeah, no, this is really, okay. really helpful. Yeah, I appreciate that. Was, that. Okay. Definitely <laughs> helpful. Yeah, especially, especially when you mentioned the law getting involved, uh, you know, that has been one of the biggest issues. You know, police have been called several times, you know, on, by right. from loved ones for this loved one. And so they, they've yeah. always handled it carefully and, you know, made sure the police understood what was going on. But then I think about how many cases where this just doesn't happen, right? And the police 100%. may not understand that. And we see some, some tragic, some tragedy things yeah. happen. So, uh, but no, this advice definitely, is definitely helpful. Yeah. I'm not pro calling the police. You saw I said go <laughs> no, down to it. the court. <laughs> <laughs> I purposely circumvented that. I was like, go to the courthouse. No, or I get it. talk. Yeah. Talk really intensely to whoever the person is at the, um, in the emergency room. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. Good. good. Um, so I'll definitely be sure to pass some of this along. Um, 
Okay. Uh, so getting getting back into uh, you know, our, our, our questions that we already have for you, um, you know, we talked a little bit about the state of the field. And, you know, can you tell us a little bit more specifically about the state of uh, black women and women of color in terms of mental health and, and wellness? You know, any stories that you'd like to share along along that line, mm-hmm. line of thinking? Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, I think our conversation is very timely with the passing of Miss U.S. She was Miss USA, right? Mm-hmm. Chelsea Chris last week <laughs> by a suicide. Um, and, you know, I saw pictures of her. I even posted about it on my own Instagram page. And I think it's a wake up call for so many black women. It's a wake up call for our community at large that black women are tired of being strong. They are tired of living with high functioning depression. And it's like a cry for help and we need to answer them. So I feel that too much burden has been placed on black women specifically in our community. And we need to decrease the stigma around getting mental health treatment. And this is where people always get kind of mad at me because everyone does not just need therapy. If you are suicidal, if you are having suicidal thoughts, if I'm you, I'm probably going to start you on an antidepressant. Does it mean you're going to be on that antidepressant for the rest of your life? No. But, you know, studies have shown that the mixture of therapy and medication is the best way to treat someone who is highly suicidal. So as a community, we have to look into different types of care. Um, Not just telling people to go to a yoga class, not just telling people to take a long walk and have a smoothie. Like, this is serious, and we need to treat it seriously. Um, So you you can tell I'm kind of annoyed and, like, very passionate about this because I just don't want more wonderful, beautiful, dynamic Black women to take their lives because, as a community, we're not giving them the space um, to seek the kind of treatment that they need. Yeah. I so, what, so you know, it's interesting because we we think about uh, Miss USA and like very successful, and you know, this mm-hmm. idea that maybe she had it all, and you know what happened. And so, can you just talk a little bit more about maybe some unique stressors that you know mm-hmm. these powerful professional, you know, I so-called mm-hmm. have it all together, Black women, like, you know, are there some like unique or, yeah, yeah, unique stressors that maybe this population is experiencing, but we don't really talk about? Yeah, a hundred percent. Several stressors, microaggressions that work, which we talked about a little bit earlier, um, having to always be on, having to be in different spaces, particularly in work, and those the more high-powered your job is, the more likely that you are the only Black person, um, feeling like you're a representative for your race, learning different sociocultural behaviors that may not be completely natural to you um, as an African-American or a person of the African diaspora, and constantly having to fit in um, to a work environment or a world at large that was not designed or built for you. And those things slowly eat away at your self-esteem. They slowly eat away at your mental psyche. They slowly eat away at just your perception of self. Um, So definitely that's something specific to Black women. I would also say for the Black women who have it all or the idea of having it all, I blame us a little bit um, as a community. We put a lot of pressure on Black women to do everything and to do everything well and to do everything without complaining and to do everything flawlessly and what did the Beyonce thing say? And I woke up like this and you have to look good and you have to run a 4K and then also be, you know, boss bitch and all of that. And I think we were putting way too much pressure and all that further um, exaggerated and blown out of portion by social media and scrolling through timelines and feeling like you have to keep up with the Joneses. So I think all of these things together, the history um, of how mental illness has been treated in this community and currently and presently the pressure to be perfect, all of these things together are coming, um, are coming together to create a perfect storm for um, high-achieving Black women in terms of their mental wellness. 
Mm. No, I think that's important, especially that um, self accountability aspect of, you know, how how may mm-hmm. we contribute to some of these these pressures? Um, I think that's really important. I'm glad you you are you raised yeah. that concern, um, and I think that's something folks yeah. should think about more for sure, especially with social media, like you said, 100. Mm-hmm. percent And then also with relationships, um, making sure that the relationships that individuals have are quality, like quality friendships, not you know, a surface friendship, um, romantic relationship. That's a big pain point for a lot of black women as well due to um, the lack of availability and black women who specifically want to partner with black men. That's a great stressor as well. Feeling, you know, not worthy, not feeling validated because you're 35, 36, 40, however old, and unable to have the family that matches all of the other accomplishments and things that you have checked off in your life. That's another big stressor I see with a lot of black women. Mm. No, that's real. Uh, you know, I see that with a lot of my friend groups as well. So mm-hmm. I think it really, it really resonates with uh, me and I'm sure a lot of black women in, in, in terms of being mentally well, um, you know, mm-hmm. what are some of the barriers to mental wellness that professional women of color face? I know I have a friend mm-hmm. who's big time professional attorney and all this kind of stuff. And I know she recently put a post this week because it was her 40th birthday. And, you know, I think she just said that, mm-hmm. hey, one of the things I have to start doing is is making time for my wellness uh, because mm-hmm. she's so on the go, trying to accomplish so much and like live up to that standard. Like you said, that mm-hmm. partially internal and you know societal as well. So, you know, what what are some of these barriers that prevent black women from from getting to mental wellness? What I've noticed, um, just a little bit of background on me. So I did my residency at University of Miami, here in Miami, I still live in Miami. But I did a year of fellowship um, in Philadelphia at Penn. And what in, in both of those populations, I saw a great number of Black women. Um, but those, the population that was typically treated were those who were more indigent, those who had come into contact with social services, those who had, um, had substance abuse problems. I believe that limited access to mental health care is the biggest barrier for professional educated black women. Um, black women of lower socioeconomic status typically come, you know, into contact with psychiatric care, um, therapy, something through, you know, CPS and all of that. So for educated black women who have, quote unquote, stayed on this path, this, you know, yellow brick brick road and all of that, they don't even know how to go about accessing mental health care um, because it's something that's so foreign to them. It's not something that was um, court mandated. So I think that's the first issue for black women. Um, even if you're very well off, it's still very expensive to see a therapist. It's still very expensive to see a psychiatrist. Um, and I blame, I keep talking about stigma. So let me give you a little history. So in, um, in medicine, psychiatrists are typically looked down upon. So we are one of the lowest paid specialties. Um, it's, Still not like fully. Res- it's getting better, but it's still not fully respected the way it is. Um, so, excuse me, it's still not fully respected like other specialties in medicine. So, individuals that I went to school with who were really talented, really smart, who had an interest in behavioral health, chose not to go into psychiatry and chose higher paying specialties. So, because of that, and because of the stigma related to mental health and even mental health providers, we don't have enough mental health providers. Because we don't have enough mental health providers, then we don't have enough people to actually see everyone who wants to be seen. So then because insurance companies don't reimburse mental health treatments the same as they do, you know, surgeries and everything like that, most mental health providers don't accept insurance and only do private pay. So everything you see is like a cascade of events that leads from the stigma to everything being so expensive so that, hey, I want to take care of my mental wellness. Hey, I want to see a therapist. I want to talk about that trauma that happened in my childhood. Hey, I want to do these different things. I want to go to that, you know, spa retreat. I want to sign up for, um, you know, I want to go to this yoga retreat in another country. All the things that are centered around mental wellness and just kind of just being a stable, functioning human being are super expensive. And unfortunately, our society, it's by design. 
No, that's that's absolutely real. And I'm happy, you know, you talked about some of those barriers and even, you know, putting it out there. We need more mental health <laughs> providers. We need more psychiatrists. Yeah. Um, Psychologists, everyone. Yeah, yeah, true, true, true. Um, so you've written about racial trauma and coping strategies. And like, you know, you just previously mentioned that people are often like walking around day to day with various traumas. And so can you, you know, talk a little bit about, you know, strategies for coping as well as like maybe even some of like thinking about your evidence based approaches like how do you approach trauma, especially racial trauma? So that's a great question. So coping skills on a day-to-day -day basis. So first of all, we need to look at what was the trauma. Did it happen in childhood? Did it happen, you know, more recently in adulthood? Day-to-day -day strategies. Unfortunately, at first, there's some things you need to avoid certain things that may trigger you, that remind you of the trauma, be it sexual, physical, emotional. Um, I don't think it's always necessary to re-traumatize yourself um, and re-experience horrible things that have happened to you in the past. I, once again, always just encourage people, find a therapist that you can trust, um, an individual that you can speak to on a weekly or every other weekly basis who can help you identify coping strategies that are specific to you. So for some individuals, it's necessary to sublimate what they're experiencing and their trauma. So they'll do the complete opposite of it. They'll do, you know, they'll run marathons. They'll do something very positive that's good for their body. Um, they'll go to soup kitchens so that they can use their time to help others. So those are just like, you know, a few examples of how individuals deal with trauma, but on a day-to-day -day basis, I would just recommend finding someone who you can really trust to talk about that trauma and kind of working through it bit by bit, piece by piece in a way that is, um, that does not re-traumatize you again. But coping strategies are just so specific on an individual basis. I'm just thinking about my patients. So I, I see on a daily basis, I see incarcerated individuals. And, you know, the trauma and the stories that I hear are unlike anything that I've ever heard in my life. Um, and a lot of what we do with those patients, um, different workbooks, different therapy groups, um, they meet with the therapist as frequently as the facility, you know, allows it. And in some instances, the trauma is so severe, they're having nightmares where they're re-experiencing um, the traumatic episodes. They, I feel like that sound like a drug pressure. And in some instances, some individuals need medication. So I prescribe medication for some of my patients with PTSD. Yeah. No, that's real. That's real. I think okay. That, I think that, um, yeah, we talk about trauma, especially racial trauma, and especially mm -hmm. in the past few years for sure, it's kind of collective trauma we've experienced as a, as a group. Um, yeah, I think yeah. there's certain things to do to protect your mental wellness, your mental health. I know for me, mm -hmm. it's been trying to intentionally stay away from content, movies and shows yeah. that are going to reproduce or re-show those <laughs> images or those feelings. Mm -hmm. um, and there's so much of it now, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's sometimes it's hard to stay away from. But, yeah, I've been more intentional with that. Like, what am I watching and what kind of feelings Consuming. is it? Yeah. Yeah. What it gives me. A hundred percent. I don't I haven't seen any of those videos of black men being murdered by the police. I haven't seen, I didn't see Philando Castile. I didn't even watch George Floyd. I just, I heard about it. I saw like a clip, but I refused to watch it because it, I was getting stressed out. I was feeling, you know, overwhelmed and very, very sad and angry. And as someone who's already taken in so much from my patients, I couldn't preload myself with more racial trauma. Mm -hmm. So definitely, that's what I do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then even now, it's on TV shows and on movies and like everywhere. Yeah. Um, they're telling these stories. And so, yeah, no, I get it. I get it for sure. Um, I don't watch modern TV shows. I just watch TV shows set 200 years ago. Because <laughs> <Okay. laughs> I can't. I can't. I just avoid everything from the past 100 years. <laughs> no, it, ma it makes sense. It makes sense. I get it. <laughs> um, uh, let's turn our attention a little bit to your organization. I'm Tara. Am I saying that correctly? 
Amtar, yeah. Amtar, yeah. okay. And uh, can you tell <laughs> us about the mission and your motivation for, you know, found again and getting it started? Okay, sure. Um, started out, it's actually related very much to my job. And so it fits what we're discussing. So my job is, you know, heavy. Um, I'm glad that I'm able to provide the services that I do to the population that I serve. However, I needed something in my life that was a little bit balanced, um, something where I wasn't just taking a lot of sadness, um, a lot of, you know, horrific stories. I wanted to create something as well and put out something that could help a population, which I mentioned earlier, that I think is oftentimes overlooked and forgotten about. So like everyone else, I started during the pandemic (laughs) um, in March of 2020. I picked the name Amtar Wellness. Um, My father is from Senegal in West Africa. So I wanted to pick, um, I was very intentional about picking a word from my ethnic group, my tribe. So Amtar means to be beautiful in the Wolof language. So went ahead, named the organization, started um, blogging, writing, trying to do a little bit of speaking. But I realized that my main mission and goal was to create wellness spaces and comfortable, beautiful, um, and balanced spaces for educated and professional Black women to talk about a lot of the things that we've discussed today. Um, I was very, very... And then once I started like doing research as well on what the wellness industry was looking like, especially back in 2019, 2020, I noticed that a lot of the individuals leading different wellness um, companies were not health, mental health professionals, which I found super weird. So I wanted to create a product um, with, as you said earlier, with just evidence treatments and not necessarily treatments, but just individuals who on a day-to-day basis do this. So I'm working with two psychologists, you know, two young black female psychologists who are dynamic and amazing. And we're developing different coursework and different um, activities for the first wellness summit in April. And I just wanted us to create something for black women that was of a this is from some bougie high caliber rather than just more memes and more slogans and feel good things. I wanted it to be something evidence-based um, in psychology and psychiatry and provided by individuals who do that in their day-to-day work. I just want to say there is nothing bougie about quality. And that's what it sounds <laughs> like. <laughs> Thank you. (laughs) So uh, you actually have a mental wellness summit in the works. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Can you share some some details about that for our listeners? Sure. Um, So this is going to be the first in a series of mental health day summits. And I thought it was good to start off talking about love, Um, talking about romantic love, talking about self-love. Um, something that I think goes beyond race, class, gender, um, but especially necessary for young Black women to just get an idea of how to love, how to love yourself a little bit better, how to engage in romantic relationships that, you know, you don't have to compromise your integrity. So on April 16th in Miami, Florida, um, downtown Miami, myself and the two psychologists, Dr. Kahina and Dr. Michelle, we will be hosting the first of hopefully a series of summits. Um, Each summit will be focusing on a different topic. Um, I hope to get to workplace um, microaggressions. I want to talk about colorism. I want to talk about a wide swath of, you know, different issues that affect um, professional black women. So, yeah, that's it. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Really happy and excited that you're doing this kind of work. And hopefully if any of our listeners in the area, you guys, you know, look it up and, and take part if you can, uh, for sure. I think this is some really good stuff. Um, you know, awesome. we, we've covered all the questions we had in this short period of time. And, you know, it's been mm-hmm. a really excellent conversation. And we just want to, you know, make sure flip it back over to you in case there's something that we didn't ask about or didn't touch on that you might want to share and get that across right now. I just 
want to encourage whoever's listening, um, as I stated before, regardless of gender, race, class, if you need help, please seek that help. If you feel suicidal, there are resources out there. If you're feeling depressed in a way that you've never felt before, please reach out. Um, not, I'm not saying to me specifically, but please reach out in your community and find the help that you need. It's there. It's not always easy to get to, but please, 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 please fight for your mental well-being. Fight for your mental health. It's worth it. Oh, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, I think that's some really good closing remarks uh, to live by and, and, you know, move forward. And as we all are trying to find our way in some pretty hectic times, to say the least, um, uh, you want to take some time to plug um, social media's website and all that stuff? Oh, sure. So on Instagram, I'm Dr. Annie, A-M-I-C-I-S-S-E. And the event, you can find the registration um, information at Beyond Love Jones dot slash that dot com um, so hope to see you if you're in the Miami or South Florida area it's going to be a great event thank yes. you We'll be sure to plug um, those socials and that information on the description of this episode. So for any of our listeners listening, make sure you, um, you know, click on the description and you'll see uh, quick links to the attachment to, to connect uh, with Dr. Cisse. So definitely appreciate you taking the time to come, you know, drop this knowledge you. and share your experience and all the wonderful <laughs> work that you've been doing for sure. I really appreciate you having me on. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Your death. So, what do you think about Dr. Cisse coming to you know drop knowledge about being a board certified psychiatrist and all the wonderful work she's doing about really helping professional Black women? I think that's you know very much needed in this day and age. <laughs> yeah, it was such a timely conversation given what just happened with uh, Miss USA uh, mm-hmm. Chelsea Chris, mm-hmm. and I think there's you know just these ideas more broadly about like what it looks like to have mental health issues, Um, who should be happy versus who should not be. And I just think it's more important than ever that we have these conversations and that we really destigmatize mental uh, wellness because um, Dr. Cisse mentioned like the stigma. And so I think it's really important that we begin to destigmatize mental health. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I really like the focus on professional black women because um, she, she mentioned in the interview, you know, um, and I really didn't think about it too much. But, yeah, the societal pressures that we all just as a culture kind of put on black women, you know, black girl magic and to do all these wonderful things, which black women are. But I think, yeah, you don't realize that like to live up to that standard, it can already increase the added pressures that a lot of black women go through and just on a day to day basis. And so um, especially this population of professional black women who, you know, on the outside always seem like they got it together. They got things going. They, they're on top of their game. But sometimes like, hey. How come no one is reaching out and saying, hey, you need some assistance. You need some help, too. We're here for you. Um, And so I think it's just a population that sometimes is overlooked when we're talking about needing assistance and needing resources because of that perception of, oh, they got it all. They good. Let's give it to or let's focus on other people. I think that's just really, really important. You know, absolutely. You know, I know I think black people in general, we we always showing up for, you know, folks. I was just listening on Audible last night to Tressy uh, McMillan Cottons thick. And like there was a line in I think the first essay where she talked about like black women, you know, we're helping out with the church, sir. You know, we helping out with the church. We're Mm -hmm. helping out professionally. We're, you know, leading this and, you know, offering that. And it just takes a toll. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, it really does. It really does. So, you know, I think this work is really important. I do appreciate the conversation we had too about just how to help people find help for loved ones. I think, like I said, I mentioned in the, in, during the interview, you know, that's something that my extended family and I just been having a lot of conversations about and issues about um, to, and like, even how the point of the caretakers or the, the loved ones that are, have the most interaction with this person, how they need help. I mean, I think that's really true because the folks that I know that have been working really closely with these family members who have mental illness, you know, their blood pressure has gone up. You know, their doctors are like, hey, what's what's going on? You know, um, and it's mainly because of the stress uh, that's accumulated because of all of this. Um, and I think, yo, that's 
that's real and that's important. Like you got to take some space for yourself and, and get some distance if you can to make sure that you ain't, you know, getting sick and getting hurt as well physically because you're trying to help this person out. Um, so I really appreciate, you know, that that connection and that advice given because I think, you know, there's something in our community that we're not, we understand we need help with or assistance, but we don't know, you know, what are the first steps or what can we do because it's all fairly new to us in our community. So mm-hmm. I appreciate Dr. Cissé for that advice. Yeah, I was really happy that you asked that question because I do have a close family member who has um, a mental health issue where, you know, it is a medicated uh, mental health issue. And in the past, having to like step up and be supportive, but also being in that position to where you as a family member you're potentially vilified because the type of help that they need is it it requires you to make decisions on their behalf Mm -hmm. and you know maybe it might be related to their freedom or whatever it is and like dealing like that takes a toll because Mm -hmm. it creates uh issues between you and that loved one And beyond that, it's kind of like, you know, there are questions of if the loved one just doesn't want help or they're not ready, what does it mean to protect your mental Mm -hmm. Mm well-being? So I was I appreciated that you asked that question. Oh, yeah. No, no doubt. It was a really, really good conversation. And who better to ask than a board certified psychiatrist (laughs) like Dr. C said (laughs) to drop that knowledge for us. Exactly. Um, um, so really excited, uh, really excited about her organization, AMTAR, really excited about the summer sum, uh, summer summits coming up and mental wellness summit, uh, summits as well. So hopefully you all check those details out, click those links on attached to the description of this episode, because I think it'll all be helpful and just somebody to know in case you do have further questions or you want to follow folks on social media. It's always good to have some kind of networking with these individuals. So appreciate Dr. Cisse. If you haven't followed us yet, follow us on social media at BHD Podcast. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can also visit our website, blackandhollydangerous.com. If you have, you don't want to keep up with our latest content, you can also email us bhdpodcast at gmail.com. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, ideas, just want to say hello. We always love to hear from you. Then please review and rate us on iTunes. That helps us out with the algorithm so that more people can find us. And after you do that, share us with your friends, share us with your family, and share us with your enemies. And as always, continue to be the oppressor's worst fear. If you're interested in continuing this and other conversations, visit our website, blackandhollydangerous.com to subscribe to our email list, suggest topics, and participate in our discussion forums. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at BHD Podcast. And please don't forget to subscribe and rate our podcast on your favorite platform. And as always, continue to be the oppressor's worst fear.